Hello and welcome to an Unreal tutorial. In this video we're going to be looking at splines, namely one use case of splines. And in this case we're going to be looking at how to create a simple conveyor belt style spline effect. So as you can see on screen right now we have these trays of bread just going along this spline, this white line here that you can see on the screen. And we're going to go through how this was achieved fairly simply. So we're not going to go too much into detail with splines in this video. We will in future videos. So please stay tuned. Remember to like, comment and subscribe to follow our updates. So first things first, so I'm just going to stop this simulation. And as you can see, we have our kind of factory space here. The assets used for this project are available or linked down in the description down below from the Unreal Marketplace. So without further ado, let us begin. So first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to create some actors, some blueprint actors in this case. So I'm going to right click and I'm just going to create some blueprint classes. And the first one I'm going to create is going to be actor and I'm going to call this track two. And the reason I'm calling this track two is because in my scene, I already have this track here and I don't want to duplicate the name as you can imagine. I'm going to double click on that actor class and under components I'm just going to add a spline. So a spline if you don't know is basically a sort of path or set of paths points that we can create where you have a start and an end and we can create points in between that and you can use splines for a variety of fit purposes for whether it's making characters follow a certain set pathway or whether you want to have a road contort to the mountains or fields or the terrain itself etc. We're just going to use it today just to have an object attach to this track and follow its pathway. I'm just going to rename this spline and I'm going to call this track to follow. And I'm just going to compile and save and just close this for now. I'm going to drag this into my scene. And as you can see here, we have our spline, this white line, and the white circle represents the root origin point. So I can move this endpoint. So I can move it over here. If I was to click on the spline and right click, I can add a variety of spine points in between and as you can see when I've got a little selected I've got these little handles so I can use these handles to adjust the curvature of said spline. You can even change that spline point to be linear so you can have it a bit more sort of straight edged or constant where it goes straight and then straight again. Just going to undo those changes. There we go. We're not going to worry too much about the actual spline itself in terms of how the track is laid out. That doesn't really, that's not really the purpose of this video. So we're now going to need to create the actor that's going to be adhered to this spline, this track. So I'm just going to right click, create another blueprint class, another actor. And we're going to call this item to follow. This could be named anything you want. This could be apples, it could be car part number one, you know, it could be anything. We're going with the route of an assembly line or a sort of conveyor belt in this case. But it doesn't have to be, you could use, like I said, this could be used to create, have an actor follow a set path or have a group of actors follow a path. We're just going to go, we double clicked on it, we're just going to create a static mesh. We're just going to have this as a plastic box. So let's go with this one here. And again, you see that the object in this case has got its default root set to zero, zero in the middle of the object. If we wanted the static mesh to be offset from our scene root, which is the circle here, we could always move our child actors in relation to this starting point. So remember we have to sometimes have to press compile to the same so we can see we can move it left, right, offset, etc. But we're just going to keep it in the middle for now. It doesn't really matter too much what this is for the purposes of this video. Uh, but what we're going to need to now do is we're going to now need to set up the blueprints, the kind of 
references the control mechanism. Now, this blueprint could be set up as a separate actor that could be controlling these actors in between. We're treating it as having the object adhered to the track in this case, or the other blueprint. So there's many ways about doing this. We're just doing it this one way. If you want to find alternative ways, there's plenty of resources out there. I'm just going to show you this one method today. So I'm just going to open up the event graph. And I'm just going to delete the event tick and begin overlap, because I don't need those today. And we're going to start off by creating some variables. So these variables are going to be our kind of values that we can relate that to. So for example, in our details panel here, if I was to select the object, we could actually reference back to variables that we link within our blueprint, our map essentially. But it's also what we're going to use to reference objects or items outside of this object itself. So we're going to need to create a few variables. So I'm going to click variable there. And the first one I'm going to call active item. And we're going to keep this as a Boolean. And I'm going to make that visible. When you've got whenever you make a variable visible, it means it appears within the details panel here. If the eye is closed, then the user can't see it and they have to go into the blueprint to change your values. So that's basically what that means. It's a publicly visible variable. It means it can be called upon by other blueprints or by other programs within Unreal a lot easier. I'm going to create another variable, but this time I'm going to change it to be a float. And we're just going to call this variable duration. And again, make this one visible. Duplicate again, and I'm going to... Oops, With this variable select, so I'm just going to call this one offset time. So this is going to be how we can offset our uh, distances. But so, for example, our duration is going to tell us how long the animation goes from getting the item from point A or point B, so from start to finish of that spline. The offset is going to be the delay that happens before the animation fires or is triggered, essentially. We can use the offset, and we'll see later on, to create multiple copies of an object and have them follow each other at separate periods so you can have, add gaps essentially like we have on our conveyor belt. But again, we'll see that later on. We're going to create one more, but this one we're going to keep as invisible. And this is just going to be called alpha. And this will just control the visibility of our object essentially. So as it appears or disappears, we want it to go from visible to invisible, on, off. That's basically all this is. It's an on, off switch or on, off variable. And lastly, we're going to create one more variable. But this one is going to be a object reference. So we're going to look back at our track. And you know, remember, we called our spline track to follow. So we're going to go back to our item to follow here, click on our new variable, change the float type to be track to follow. Just check that is compiled and saved. And then we'll try again. Track to let's just compile this. Let's go to object type, sorry, and we'll go to actor. Object reference. And we'll just call this track variable type. And we're just going to type in track two, referencing this object here. And we're going to make sure it's an object reference of that blueprint, like so. And we're also going to make that one visible as well, so we can reference it back in the details panel. OK, so now we've got that. We're going to now need to start to create our blueprint. I'm just going to press Compile and Save again. So as we go through this, Compile and Save frequently, just so we don't lose anything we're doing. I'm going to start off by dragging from our event Begin Play and add in a branch. 
This is going to be our condition checker. And we want this to check whether the active item, so active item, drag it in, get active item. So if active item is present in the beginning of the scene, then we want this truth statement to fire. So what we want the statement to do is we want it to fire off a custom event. So we want it to trigger off a separate event, basically a separate event chart. Let me just make this bigger so we can see what we're doing as we go further into it, because this is going to get a little bit uh, messy if we're not careful. So I'm just going to right click and type in custom event, add custom event. Call this move item. So we want this to be checking whether this item is there. If it is true, we want it to fire off this event series. So we're going to go from true, type in move item to call the function of the move item. Like so. So once the event begins, it checks whether the item is present. If so, move item fires off custom event. And what we're going to do from now is we're going to drag from this custom event, type in set play rate, and we're going to turn off context sensitivity, and we're going to make sure that we're under timeline set play rate, because we're going to be using the timeline component to control our animation in this case. So make sure it is the timeline version, not the animation version of set play rate. I'm going to drag my duration into my scene, get duration. I'm just going to drag from that and type in float divided by float, like so. And link this to my new rate here. So we're going to need to create a target, which we'll reference in a bit. So once we get to the timeline part, we're going to need to come back here and link up the timeline to this target, but we haven't created it yet, so just bear with. And we're just going to drag from here and get set new time, making sure we're on the timeline version again. We're going to click our offset time, get offset time, and drag this to our new time here. So this will be the controller to adjust whether the object starts at the beginning or whether it starts after a set amount of time or percentage. So the way we're going to treat this is zero is off or start and one being finished, so 100% essentially. So if we think about it that way, so zero off, one on, zero start, one end. That's the kind of logic we're working with here. I'm now going to drag from our set time. I'm just going to create a timeline. So type in timeline, add timeline. I'm going to call this item move. And I'm just going to double click on this. And this will open up our timeline window. I'm going to add a float. And I'm going to call this alpha. Now this isn't the alpha that we've got here, it's a different one, but it will uh, link up as you'll see later. Making sure the synchronized view is enabled. If we want the animation to loop, we have the loop on, and if we want it to use the last keyframe as part of its animation, then we need that enabled as well. So I'm just going to right click at zero, zero, add keyframe. So at the very, at zero, zero, it will start at the uh, zero point. So at zero seconds, that basically starts there. Uh, if we remember, we're treating zero as start and one as end, so I'm going to go to one, one here. Right click, add point there at one, one, or as close to one, one as I can get it. Again, compile and save. Now we will get errors, this is normal. If we go back to our event graph, you'll see here the reason we've got the errors is because it's trying to reference something that isn't at the moment, doesn't exist at the moment. So I'm just going to go to my item move here, drag this into my t event stream here and just get the item. So this is the get item move. And I'm just going to hook this up to my targets on the set play rate and the set new time. I'm just going to tie this up by adding a little node just so I can, uh, so you can see the connections more clearly. If I press compile now, that should remove the errors. So I'm going to select my item move, select drag from the update, add, type in alpha, and make sure it's the variable set alpha. 
I'm just going to link the alpha from the item move to the alpha in the set, like so. And then I'm going to drag from here and type in set actor location and rotation. So what this is going to do here is it's going to take our item and make sure the item is moving and is set to be to the relation of our spline, which is what we're going to now set up. So at the moment, this actor knows it should be looking to connect to something, but it hasn't got any uh, uh, details on what the uh, that item's location or, loca or um, target actually is at this point in time, which is what we need to now tell it. So I'm just going to drag our track into our scene, get track. drag from our track use spline oh that's my bad there let's just type in get track to follow sorry and then just type our track back in and link this up there we go. Sorry about that. You have to make sure that you're dragging the track in and then you want to make sure you, you, you're basically linking it to that spline name. So you notice that I could drag from here. You want to type in the name that we call our spline. So if we look back at our track here, we call it track to follow. And I just want to make sure that is set to uh, reference it, so get it. So track to follow, get track to follow, and that's what we want, like so. We now want to get the details of that spline, so we're going to get spline length. And we're going to take that return value and pass it into a LARP or a LERP float. And this interprets or interpolates the values between A and B. So in this case, it's only taking the one value, so this is our A. Um, but we're going to basically want it to interpret the values between that and return it in relation to our alpha. So whatever our alpha value is, which is determined largely by our animation we've created here, so that's the appearance and disappearance of this object, the speed at which the object moves essentially, that we're taking into account. It's going to interpret it between that and the length of the spline to make sure that the speed of the object moving is in relation to the length of that spline. We're now going to drag from our LARP. We're going to get location at distance along spline. And I'm just going to drag from our track to follow to our target here. Just tidy this up a bit so it's a bit easier to see. So we're now referencing back to our track. It's taking the spline length details from that track into its coordinates here. Change the coordinate space to be willed, so it takes into relation to will, not just the object itself. So it's going to be more, uh, well, basically it'll work the way we want it to, essentially. We're going to take the return value, get rotation at distance along spline. We want to set this one to be willed as well. And again, I'm going to drag back from my track to follow to my target. Let's tidy this up so again it's a bit easier to see. And you can kind of guess where we're going with this. We're going to take the return values from our location and hook them up to our location values in our set actor location rotation here. And likewise with our rotation. So let's just check everything is set up correctly. So active item into here, once the active item is there, it checks, move, activates this move item, which sets off our custom event, which then allows us to adjust play rate of that said item by the duration that we set within the details panel of the object. That will then trigger our animation to play. So the animation will play from zero to one. We can again adjust these curves if we wanted to. So we can adjust the sort of ramping speed it does from getting from start to finish. Once that is done, it's then going to set the location of the item or the active item to the location value of our track. 
and it's looking for the spline within our track object and using that to gauge a distance to coordinate the position and rotation of that object along that track. Okay, so I'm going to press compile and hit save. And let's just minimize this. And I'm just going to now drag that item to follow into our scene. And if, we have, if we've got selected here, you'll notice in our details panel, we have the options we created. So remember those variables that we made that were have the eye appearing next to them, make them publicly visible within the details panel? Well, they're here under default. So we're going to adjust the duration, let's say, to 10 seconds. We're going to want to tell it to look for a track. So in this case, because we've already referenced the track within the blueprint, it's limiting the options to only track two. So we're just going to select track two, which is this object here. And if I press play, you'll see nothing happens. And that is because there's one thing we've got to do. We've got to make sure that we activate the item. So if we click activate item and press play now, you'll see that the object is moving, but it's kind of moving quite erratically. So this will be to do with the way that our spline is set up. So let's just have a look at how this has been configured. Oh, let's just move these values back. So basically these spline values here have somehow shifted to be underground. So we're just going to quickly fix that. So this is where it can get a little bit um, tricky sometimes. So you, working with splines is a little bit uh, annoying unless you kind of get used to uh, the nuances of them. So let's just move it over here. And now if I press play, you see it's moving, but it's moving super fast. That is because we've set the speed here duration to be 10 seconds. If I increase that to be, let's say 60, you notice it's still moving stupidly fast. So this will be an issue of our blueprint. So if we go back to our object and what the issue actually is here is happening in this point here. So I'm just going to break this connection and link this back up like so. So it's one divided by our duration length. Press file save and let's try plus and play now. And now you should see it's moving as we'd expect. But it seems to be moving in the wrong direction. So if we go back to our object set here, this is because our LARP or interpretations here are essentially, it's taken our first value, so it's taken our start point and it's reversing it. If we was to swap this, break this connection and link this back to B, then press compile and save and run it again. It will now start from our start position, move along the spline and take 60 seconds or 60 frames to get from here to here. If I adjust the speed and making sure I do that when it's not uh, playing, you notice it now moves uh, faster. If I offset it, I can, let's say I offset it to 20 and I press play now. You notice that nothing really happens because the offset is basically in relation between zero and one. So if I offset it, let's say by 0 0.75 and then press play, you notice it starts at 0 0.75 or three quarters of the way along our path at the beginning. Now, why would that be useful? Well, if we wanted to, let's say like our conveyor belt here, and you notice we've already got four boxes there, there's a reason. Uh, we wanted to have boxes following each other. I could simply duplicate this object in our scene, have my duplicate copy to be set to, let's say, 0 0.5 or halfway through the uh, timeline. And if I press play, you'll notice that we now have two of the objects. And once this one finishes the end here, it will reappear at the beginning because in our timeline, we set it to be loop and return to beginning frame. And we can basically between the zero's value of zero and one, so between, let's say, 0% and 100%, if you want to think of it that way, we can adjust the kind of timings between that the uh, boxes or multiple copies appear. Now, 
what we could also do with this is once we've got our actor, we could duplicate the actual actor, go back into our scene, go back into our viewport. And let's say we adjust this one to be a, um, a canister. So let's say one of these and we just press compile and save and then go back to here and then drag this one in. And we change this one's time to be, well, the duration of that is 15. So let's just keep the duration the same. So one isn't moving faster than the other, but we change the offset. So one is starts halfway through, then press play, Oop, making sure that this track is set and the item is actually active. Now press play. You notice that we can have different items still following the same line path. And now these objects still have collisions attached to them. So if I go to play in selected viewport and I basically stand here, you notice that my actor is getting pushed around by these objects or can even stand on them. So you could use this technique for moving platforms or lifts, for example. And as you see, it teleports me with it if I'm on it to the very beginning again, because it's taking everything that's within this object or containing this object and taking it with it. And that is the simple basics of splines for purposes of making a simple conveyor belt system. Now, we can obviously take this a lot further. We can start looking at how we could implement control. So the key press, for example, to control whether something starts or stops or just the speed of something. Because if you remember, we have the values we have the values of our object here, so we can actually control the speed of that object, we can control the timeline of the object, etc. You know, we've got we've got a lot of playroom here, and it's basically just open to us to, you know, consider the use cases for this sort of technique. So hopefully this has been useful. Remember that to like, comment and subscribe because your subscriptions and follows and likes, etc., does contribute heavily to the way the channel operates. We are largely funded through AdSense and it is only through your views and shares that we can continue making freely available tutorial content for all. So I will again see you again soon in more tutorial videos. Remember to check out our playlist and have a good day. Goodbye.